morning, everyone. Um, the, the last talk, I uh, choose to talk about uh, a work that is continuously connected to what we talked before, and this is why I choose it, but it will be a bit more uh, technically involved because it's about an actual uh, computation. Um, this is actually the way we got to all what I talked about in the uh, past talks. And this is still work in uh, progress with uh, Kolya Gromov, uh, Fedor, who is uh, a postdoc in Ordita, and Andrea, who is a student of uh, uh, Gromov. So in this uh, work, we're trying to try to understand how to compute correlation functions in general. And again, the same strategy, trying to take the most simple integrable planar theory to explore it. And it turns out that even that is not enough, and this is why we went uh, and twist the theory. And what I'll talk about is how to compute correlation function of twist operators in the fishnet model and how to ex rewrite them in terms of the most uh, useful integrable uh, data. But the idea about uh, twisting is much more general, so I want to uh, start by a bit zooming out and just give the, the idea, because it turned out to be new, and uh, only then go to a specific model. So, what the plan, okay? I'll start by describing what I'll, what I'll call color twist operator in general, and then discuss a lot what, what they, why they are useful. And uh, most of the talk will be actually about example, which is different from what we are aim for, it will be the CASP Wilson, but it's even simpler. And in the rest, it will be probably the, really the last five, 10 minutes, to finally go and apply it to correlation function of twist operator. Almost most of the talk will be overview. So what are twist operator? Twist operator is an operator that when you go around, you have to apply, it's like an orbifold, you have to apply some symmetry transformation. Because going around requires defining a two plane. So it's a co dimension two operator. And the symmetry transformation can be either internal symmetry or, uh, or uh, space time symmetry. These are uh, most familiar starting from orbifold in 2D CFT when you have the uh, twist operator in the orbifold, for example, the target plate. And they were recently uh, useful for uh, entanglement entropy. There, this symmetry can be a physical rotation or internal symmetry if you work in the replica theory. What I want to talk about today is, uh, <coughs> is some uh, generalization of that, which turned out to be actually related. In our case, the issue of going around, instead of taking part in some two-dimensional space-time, will take place in color space. So I defined uh, twist color operators, which will be an operator when you go around in color space, you apply a symmetry transformation. Um, so let, to define it properly, let's define it in perturbation theory. Okay? Because this is uh, something that, for example, people in integrability talked from the very uh, beginning how to twist uh, beta equations, stuff like that, but it was never connected to actual observables or actual perturbative computations. Let me define it just for a simple, for a scalar field in perturbation theory, what we mean by this. So define, the, uh, so let R here be some uh, symmetry transformation. We will take it some space time. For example, in a moment you will take rotation, but it can be any element of the conformal group if you are talking about conformal theory. I'll define the, uh, <coughs> the twisted operator, which will be the, what will you get from, in that case, the scalar, by applying the symmetry transformation. And you go to the uh, twisted point and you have the conformal wake of the change of uh, transformation and for scalars they have a wake one, so this delta equal to one. And maybe the, the, uh, <coughs> the simple uh, twist that we will focus on today is written here. We have four dimensional Euclidean space. I divide it into two orthogonal two planes and we do rotation by phi one in, in one plane and rotation by phi two in the other plane. So just rotation. Well, for such a rotation, this Jacobian is uh, trivial. It's uh, just one. So the scalar field just transformed to the rotated point. So Z1 and Z2 are just complexify 
of the two, these two planes. What would be now, uh, the, of course, when you do that, of course, we are breaking a lot of symmetry. Okay? We are breaking the rotation symmetry into two ones, just rotations in these two planes. But importantly, we don't break dilatation. Dilatation around the fixed point of this rotation. So if we do rotation, it's dilatation between zero and infinity. And we also keep inversion. Now, a twisted correlator, a propagator, is just a propagator between a scalar and a twisted scalar. Okay. So for scalar, it's just in position space, it's just instead of one over y minus x squared, y minus rotated x squared. That's all. I'll think about this as a, as a simplest example. In general, yes, we do have color. Uh, let's think about it now as a charge. So, uh, so it's in a bit ahead, but if I'm doing a gauge theory, when I'm putting a twist operator, I also have the offer to project only to gauge transformation that go back to themselves only after the twist. Gauge transformation at point X would be not equivalent to the point uh, X plus two pi, but two pi minus theta X. It's just I choose the, the simplest possible example. So I'll, uh, I'll uh, draw in the double line notation this twist propagator. If this is the propagator, this means twisting it. So let's now use this uh, picture to. So uh, if you ignore the dashed line, these two lines are just the free propagator in double line notation. And this dashed line means that it twisted. Why there is an arrow here? Because there is a direction of twist. I can twist by R or by R inverse. So this would be by R and this would be by R inverse. Okay, so I twist X and not Y as opposed to Y and not X. Yes, it will maybe be more clear when you go to the, ne to the next picture, okay? when you are connected to a full diagram, just by itself, it seems. You know. So here is, uh, for example, uh, one diagram that contributes in the planar limit to the two-point function of two single trace operators. So think about this as trace phi cube at some point x, and this is the conjugate one at some point one. And let's take this point x and y, to be the fixed point of our rotation. You're doing is just one rotation, one will be zero and one will be at infinity. So this is just one diagram that contributes in the planar limit to the two point function of this two operator written in the double line notation. So it's clear with the topology of the cylinder. Now I want to twist it. I want to take this operator and add to it a twist. The way we do it in perturbation theory is I'm choosing some cut it start on one point on the trace on one operator and then on some other point on another. Now, when it goes from one side to another, it has to cross a set of propagators. So this can am amount to taking any propagator that it cross and replace it by a twisted propagator. That's a, prop that's a propagator that is cut, cut. These three propagators only now. Everything else is the usual. This is, uh, I'm trying to give a definition in, uh, starting in a more very practical way of how you compute. And then we will a bit zoom out. I want to, to explain. <laughs> Yes, yes, yes. Twist operator has two fixed points. So it's not, it's not really, um, if, if you do this rotation, it's not, it's not like a primary operator. They fill also the other fixed point. That's exactly the point. So 
why this is a good uh, definition? What happens if I choose a different slice, a different place? So, uh, for example, suppose we choose this slice. Okay. Because we act with a symmetry transformation, twisting these two legs is equivalent with twisting these two. Because if I take a vertex here and I rotate all the legs together, it go back to itself. Any smooth deformation of this cut will not affect the result. Yes. One with respect to the other. This is the meaning of this arrow. You are twisting the point to the left with respect to the point on the right. Propagate all that. Yes. So if you to the right, I'm applying the same transformation. If you to the left, I uh, use untouch. And it turns out that this doesn't depend on where I draw this line. It's a, it's a global monodromy issue. Not locally, everything is the same. Because it's a symmetry. So, but. Instead of smoothly deforming the counter, you can do something else. You can let it wrap a few times before going to the other side. Around the cylinder. Okay. Going around the cylinder is equivalent to going directly plus going just once around. And going once around, you're just applying the twist transformation to the operator itself. Okay. Now, because this operator uh, is at a fixed point, fixed point doesn't transform, this gives you also projection on states or operators that are invariant under the twist. This is familiar from all before the CFTs in 2D. When you build, uh, there are also twisted sectors, but every operator in the twisted sector is to be invariant under the twist. They just have a non-trivial monodromy. This is exactly the generalization of that, but the 2D here emerged from the toothed uh, planarity and is not the, the space time. What I mean by a uh, twist, I'll uh, <laughs> drive it by uh, now uh, an operator, for example, length L, it has L scalar, it also twists, and uh, this means the two angles for the two rotations. Yes, this operator like is taking you to the twisted sector. Twisted sector, you know, on, think about it on the world sheet in a sense, but it's something that you can do in perturbation theory in the level of a single Feynman diagram. Maybe ask me in the end, but the same idea also allows you to associate modular parameters to a single Feynman diagram. But this is take us a bit off. And no, here every, every every slice is equivalent. Look at line, and then it will be a two twist operator, not one. That is another operator in, in that I can consider. Yeah. It will it will be equivalent for just taking this angle and multiply them by two. You can you can, if you take the two and combine them together, they will become, uh, they satisfy some uh, global monotomy uh, issue. If you go about it, we'll in a second I'll consider correlation function of this. There is a global monotomy that the total twist should be zero. Okay, here uh, twist and anti-twist, but in general you can consider three twists that are all different, but the total twist should be zero. Yeah. 
No, no. That's going to give me the same because it gives me a projection on the operator. The operator itself should be invariant under the twist. Going around is equivalent to going straight and acting once with the twist on the full operator. Now that this is not a crucial uh, thing for actual computing. You can choose one and then you can worry about that at the very end. Uh, here I, uh, I choose to, to do a rotation where everything looks obvious. But you can, do, uh, yeah, you can do the same with the conformal transformation. But in order to do the same with the general conformal transformation, let's say some special conformal transformation, you have to work with uh, a diagrammatic that is manifestly conformal invariant. And this is what you get when you do perturbation theory using the Lagrangian insertion. You do the Lagrangian insertion, it only generates conformal integrals. And this is why going like that or going like that give you the same because all the integration purposes of conformal integral mean that if you act with the conformal transformation on all the external legs, it is left invariant. So in conformal field theory, we can. This is, not, this is just about planarity, it's not about conformal field theory. In the conformal field theory, we can do the same with the conformal transformation. It doesn't have to be a rotation. Yeah. Yes. But I want something operational, so when you do perturbation theory, by construction, all the integrals, Turn out to be like that because sometimes to bring the integrals to this form requires some integration by parts. Do not commute <laughs> in this operation. Okay. Um, <coughs> so now consider a conformal field theory. So suppose we start with this twist operator by rotation. If you now apply conformal transformation, the twist transform. If the two fixed point was zero and infinity after some special conformal transformation, they both become finite. It means, therefore, <laughs> but we call it the twist operator by itself uh, preserved dilatation. It's still a symmetry. It means that if in the conformal field theory you compute a two-point function of two twisted operators, it just fixed by symmetry to be one over the distance, time and dimension, that now also depends on the twist. Think about it with some generalization of local operators. A, L, L was the number of scalars. Total U, U1 charge, U total R charge. Uh, the, the, yes, the bare dimension of the operator that I twisted. Mm -hmm. So this twist operator, uh, some of the generalization of local operators, we can, meaning that we can associate with them the conformal dimension. Okay. But they are not primary. Let's say. Uh, so we can now consider three point function of these. You're breaking uh, your sensitive to the other fixed point. Primary operator is primary operator that will stay the same if you move the other fixed point of your uh, dilatation operator. Or not, you have to specify the, the, the symmetry transformation automatically if it's rotation, it has two fixed points. Yeah. Primary operator is a primary is an operator that if instead of doing dilatation, I choose another uh, gener generator of the conformal group that relate to it by a, a special conformer that still act the same way around the origin, but the other fixed point is not infinity. The operator will not change. It doesn't say, say it's not sensitive to that. This is the if you want a definition of a primary operator. Yeah, we can think about it as a two point function. Open function of two twist operators, twist and anti twist. <laughs> um, I'm a bit ignoring this other fixed point because it will turn out that in our, in our model, this a pure twist operator with something physical, but it will have zero conformal uh, dimension. So 
So one can consider now a three-point function, or you can think about it more as a six-point function if you include this other uh, fixed point of each one of them. And uh, there is a condition, of course, that the total twist is zero. So here are, uh, so let's consider this diagram, for example. These two lines here means that the twist here is a rotation that takes this line to this line. Here are three of them. This one, take this line into this line. This one, take this one. Which one of them you can always draw as two circles? If you are putting, here I put all of them in the plane. So up to the conformal transformation, a straight line will map to a circle and this will write to a circle. but it will be uh, a, a fence uh, a fence like this will be the, the topology now I add this like that okay meaning that any uh, propagator that's run uh, cast is twisted but if I, I move this point and I put it here it will be the same because of the monodromy condition can be uh, arbitrary. So, uh, again, if you are just, uh, if you are not giving me the fixed point, you are just giving me the, uh, the angles, I can tune the other fixed points for any angles that you can be okay. And then another way to parameter is just giving free angles arbitrary. Yes, yeah, but if you fix a, 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 a twist operator is not just fixed by the angle. Okay, the angle is conformal invariant, it's also fixed by the, the other fixed point. Yeah. Just specify the angles without specifying then it, the, they are completely arbitrary. Why, why it is useful for uh, doing actual computation? One big advantage of twisting is that you can consider shorter operators. Usually operators start as trace phi square. This is the shortest you can do. Here we can consider length one or even length zero, which is just a twist operator. Uh, <coughs> as we said, locally, if you're doing the Feynman diagram, there is no difference. All the local symmetries, all the local tools remains the same. It's just a global monodromy issue. Uh, <coughs> Yeah, we will go to there. It was borrow from here, actually. Exactly. I want to. Um, <laughs> so you say it, it breaks the conformal symmetry because you have to choose the anti twist operator point. So when you twist operate, you consider twist operators, there is no uh, degeneracy between primary and descendants. They're all treated on equal footing, they all have different dimensions. This turns out to be something actually counterintuitive, it's something useful for integrability. In integrability, it's really hard to deal with this degeneracy. Here, every state is on its uh, equal footing, and you can uh, just discuss it by itself, make life easier. Uh, so why twist? <laughs> I wanted to say what? I started by describing general twist operator, for example, the one that arises in the entanglement entropy. This a priori seems different. Here we twist in color space. The question I wanted to, to ask here is, uh, are these related to each other? Suppose I'm considering twist operator without any reference to the planar limit, and then I take in the planar limit. Are these the same thing? So it turned out that uh, they are related, but they are not quite the same. 
let me uh, maybe uh, give an example that we are familiar with and then make the connection if it's actually the same. Suppose you consider n equal to 4 on a sphere times a circle with a temperature. And the analog of uh, this color twist operator would be the, what we call the Polyakov loop, a Wilson loop that go around the thermal circle. Think about the thermal circle as a twist by translation in time. Now suppose you're trying to compute the expectation value of the Polyakov loop. Would you have these diagrams or not? It turns out that it, it, this depends on the phase of the theory. Mm -hmm. The theory on S1 times the circle is a dimensionless parameter, which is the ratio between the temperature or inverse temperature and the radius of the free sphere. And depends on this ratio, the theory can be in different phases. And in between them, there is the Hawking page transition. The dual description is one is dominated by a large black hole and the other is dominated by a thermal ADS. These are the diagrams that you would do if you do the planar limit of this object in the thermal ADS phase. What did I do? Okay. It's actually a, a very nice and non-trivial non proof because if you start with thermal propagator and then take the, the planar limit, it's not obvious that you learn on these diagrams, but it is true. But we are we're working in flat space. Flat space meaning the, the limit where the radius of the sphere is tend to infinity, and there you are always in the black hole phase, the confined phase. And then these are not the diagrams. In other words, this diagram computes for you the, the planar contribution on the wrong phase. It's like a bit like the Hagedon transition in string theory. You can compute it exactly in the planar limit, but it's always above the Hogan page transition. Our, our, our aim here is, is, is uh, different. I'm not trying to really do physics for it. I'm trying to understand the structure. We will introduce the twist, understand the structure, but at the end of the day, we would like to take the twist to zero and connect back to the untwisted theory. Just a technical tool to understand the structure, and at the end of the day, we'll going to remove it. That's the So now the talk would be. <laughs> now, naively, if you start with Feynman diagrams, propagators are thermal propagators. So which means it's like say, any propagator is like summing over all the images. If you are trying to draw the corresponding diagram, it looks like the string is completely turned apart. But because of the Gauss constraint, it turns out that any loop in this diagram you actually have to go back to the same copy. It's a non-trivial proof when you go to this type of diagram, provided that you are in the thermal ADS phase. The group is uh, symmetry is broken or not. <laughs> oh, okay, so now I'm just going to open to open a big parenthesis to give a, a lot of background of how, what we expect how to do with computation with uh, such twist operator. And only in the last minute we'll uh, start to apply them to a correlation function. This is still work in progress. We don't have the general results for how to compute correlation functions. Twist operator, we have some few examples and starting to understand the structure. We got distracted by uh, actually the holographic description that I was uh, talking before and uh, delay a bit this work. Uh, so our aim is to solve n equal to four. We want to compute correlation functions. Yes. The twist is some uh, uh, generator of symmetry. And when you apply a conformal transformation, you conjugate it by the corresponding transformation. Where this symmetry map to under the transformation. In the twisted? No, uh, 
twist operator, in order to get a non-zero answer, you need both a twist and an anti-twist. Total twist must be zero. The inclusion of the anti-twist pick for you an extra point that break. In the background of twist and anti-twist, other operators and their descendants are, don't have the same dimension. We are interested in computing correlation function in n equal to four in the planar limit. The best uh, tool uh, today for computing such a correlation function is called the hexagon decomposition. Here, for example, uh, a Penn's diagram like that, which compute three-point function. The way people are uh, started to compute such an object using integrability is by cutting this uh, Penn's diagram open and think about this gluing of two hexagons. Each cut here has six uh, boundaries because three boundaries of the operators and the three cuts. The point is that these hexagons, what is called as asymptotic objects, they are like the topology of a disk, and one can compute them exactly, or bootstrap them exactly using asymptotic uh, <laughs> bootstrap objects. But then in order to uh, to get back the three-point function, one has to glue them together. And what it means gluing? Put, gluing means putting a complete basis on the cuts here. So one has to sum over all number of particles that are going around. And this is not understood. And only not understood, it turned out to be very, very complicated. Only some specific uh, case of one wrapping was understood in this whole already parable. What I want to uh, do today is to develop a different technique that automatically resum all this wrapping. I want you to think about, uh, connecting to yesterday, if you think about such a diagram in the fishnet theory, we call it the Feynman diagrams that have, have this wheel structure. In the fishnet theory, in a sense, for this diagram, you have only wrapping. The opposite, uh, completely opposite limit of when this is useful. This is useful when the operators are very, very large and you can neglect this effect. When the point are asymptotic, then you have a, an expansion in E to the minus the, the length, the number of operators, and the, 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 the momentum or the mirror energy of this uh, particle that goes around. Yes, so, so given, given an operator, you can ask, what is the error that I do if I neglect them? Exactly Lutcher correction. So, so like e to the exponent of minus the length of the operator times the gap in the spectrum. Yeah, if, if the gap goes to zero, for example, this is, Depends a little. For uh, most operators, really. uh, <laughs> so let me now uh, zoom out and we'll say, okay, let's. So for now, we want to compute this three-point function, correlation function, how it was developed for the spectrum. The spectrum it started asymptotically, analog of this. And then people, uh, it's ended with what is called the quantum spectral curve, which is the most efficient way of computing the spectrum of the theory in the planar limit. I will review it very shortly when we need it. But this is certainly the, the, the there will not be any step after. This is the ideal way, way of computing the spectrum uh, of an operator. And the point is that it's with some all wrapping efficiency. So in all wrapping, it's not an asymptotic expansion. Mm -hmm. Certainly when you uh, compute what is called the Q function, which are the basic elements, is what when you do these techniques that is called quantum spectral curve, you're not only getting the spectrum of operators, but you're also getting the wave function. You're also getting information about 
what, of, what is the shape of the operator you are looking at. And therefore, this data is also useful for computing correlation functions. For example, here to <coughs> connect these uh, three uh, strings, I don't only need to know the spectrum, I know, need also to know the shape such that they will connect together. And this data is included in this quantum spectral curve in a highly non-trivial way. You would expect that it will be also very useful, therefore, to compute such correlation function, including our wrapping. Be one of the main issues today, exactly that. Yes. So uh, <laughs> again, we'll take the same strategy. We try to solve the simplest problem in the simplest limit, understand the structure, and then generalize. Okay. In that case, it will be try to write the three-point function in terms of this Q function, and then go and replace them by the one in n equal to, to four and check. And usually, n equal to four is very friendly. So if you do a reasonable guess, it works. And that's the hope. Right. Right, is exactly what we're trying to understand. Right. I think you can call all information you need in order to compute, but the question is because if I'm giving you in if yeah, if I'm giving you in string theory the free vertex operators, you should be able to compute the three point function. Yeah. Right, this is exactly what we're trying to understand here. What is the prescription in terms of in this language? Okay. And this Q function should be actually the most efficient way of characterizing the wave function. So I want now to open a big parenthesis and do the same, but instead of with closed string, instead of with a single trace operator, we're going to do the analogy with Cusp-Wilson loop. What is the Cusp-Wilson loop? Here we have a Wilson, li Wilson lines with two cusps, one and this is the other. This, if we, in n equal to four, this Wilson line would be what is called the locally supersymmetric Wilson lines that couple both to the gate field and to some uh, combination of scale of the six scalars of n equal to four. Okay? In such a way that is locally supersymmetric. Now a cusp angle can have uh, <coughs> two parameters, can have a physical angle where uh, <coughs> the cusp is going to, and it has an internal angle, which means that this line can couple to one combination of scalars, and this line can keep couple to another combination of scalars. Actually, you have two angles, one physical in position space, one in the scalar space. So, again, you should think about this cusp here as a generalization of local operator. Because if you suppose I'm putting one cusp at zero and another at infinity, including these two Wilson lines that emerge from it, do not break dilatation symmetry. You can think about it as quantizing the theory on the sphere times time in the presence of quark anti quark lines. So, again, it means that the two point function of two cusp operators just depends on the, diff on the distance between them. And the power here is what we call the cusp dimension, conformal dimension of the cusp. In general, it's a function of the two angles, the physical angle and the angle in the scalar space, and the two coupling. One can even generalize this picture. Think about this picture as a bit the open string analog of the twist we were talking uh, before. We can generalize it by inserting you now scalars or other uh, field or an operator in the cusp and describing there is uh, infinite power of actually states on the sphere. Yes, this is in the planar limit. Uh, this work is more general, it's just facts of symmetry. But 
with this stuff, you're not breaking dilatation symmetry, and therefore you can characterize the state by. In terms of Wilson line, the foreclosed thing is exactly the twist. This is actually how we got to it. What I'll describe here is the analog work that was done for the cast. But then if you want to get rid of the Wilson lines to, to do it for a single trace operator, what would be the J? But the, introducing the cast angle is going to turn out to be very useful here. So how can one get rid of the Wilson line but keep this feature? And this is how we came out with the twist. It's reversing the logic. Wilson lines are, are for open string. Wilson lines are boundary conditions. So, yeah, you want Wilson line in that joint. This, this, this you can do because, yeah. Let me let it go back fast. Suppose here we have this diagram. I can always take pick a line here, which is just a set of propagators. And represent it in the what you call word line formalism. You can always rewrite uh, such propagation as uh, integral over Wilson lines in that joint. Okay. Just rewriting it. So, uh, <laughs> this was something that uh, I studied a lo long time ago using integrability. In the, <coughs> these papers, we understood how to compute the dimensions of cusp with finite capping using integrability. And later, uh, by a coalescing collaborator, they uh, wrote the quantum spectral curve for that. The generalization of the one for single trace operator automatically to, to, to computes for you all the spectrum of cusp operators, or the spectrum of n equal to 4 on the free sphere in the presence of quark anti quark lines. So now when we understand the two-point function, let's consider the three-point function of cusp operators. As before, one will consider three of them. The angles are arbitrary. If I'm uh, continuing these li two lines here, ignoring the less, they will meet at the third another point here. And one can normalize by the two-point function. So by conformal symmetry, it's given by the standard uh, dependence on the distances. But here on top, there is what we call a structure constant, but it's really depending on the cusp angles. The cusp angles you can think about also as conformal cross ratios if I'll draw the other fixed points. Now, if I'll, if I'll in other case, consider this. So, Let's, for simplicity, put now everything on the plane. Let's for simplicity. Everything on the plane, and there is no difference. The symmetry is wise, it's the same thing. Thank you. Also here, from symmetry, if I'm taking these two lines and continue them, they will meet here. I'll draw such a picture in a second. Actually, the, the picture I drew before was taken from uh, the one from the cusps. The structure, the, what we, you could call, naively call the structure for a constant here, is a function of the angles. And even, even the same thing. The symmetry is the same. Yeah. Only the, the open does the close thing there, but the symmetry right is the same. Uh, <coughs> so this is still uh, <coughs> very hard to try to compute with finite coupling. But let's now take a simplified limit, which will be the analog of the fishnet limit we discussed before. This is the limit where it's the diagrammatic is dominated by ladder diagrams. And the way to do it is to send the original tooth coupling to zero, 
At the same time, we send the internal twist angle for the scalars to i times infinity. Keeping this uh, combination, same one, same, it's exactly the same limit we talked about yesterday, but the open string version. And uh, this we did uh, long ago when considering the, the cusp. And the nice thing about it is that it's projecting you only to ladder diagrams, only to, to scalar propagators that propagate from one side to the other. The reason is that anything else would uh, cost G, the tooth capping, which is going to zero. Yes, I'll make this analogy uh, more precise uh, in a second, yes. But the fishnet limit is nothing but the ladder limit. Exactly the same. If one, uh, <laughs> and if one now draws the cast by adding in the scalars, locally we will get the same uh, wheel type diagram, but it will be now instead of closed, it will be open. So here is uh, this two point function now in the ladder limit, where we only have to resum all ladders, any number of ladders. And uh, lambdas here are cutoffs. We are summing up to some point. You can think about it the analog of the point splitting for uh, describing this point. So why this is non trivial? This is non trivial because we are in the planar limit. These ladders cannot cross each other because of color ordering. So they are uh, mount to each other. And this would give you the highly non trivial structure of this uh, two point function and the conformal domain. Now, as it's uh, well known, such a ladder sum satisfies what's called the beta salpeter equation. If I'm taking this correlator and I'm taking derivative with respect to these lambdas, this lambda was the end of the integration of this uh, propagator. If I'm put, taking a derivative with respect to this point, I'm stretching a propagator here. Uh, so this co regulated correlation function satisfies the equation that if you take two derivatives, you get back the same object times the propagator. Lambdas are the cutoffs. Okay. Yes, here, here I'm studying, I'm regulating, okay? Of course, there is a UV divergent here where the cusp goes to zero, a wave function renormalization for the cusp, just the same as for a local operator, so I'm regulating it by uh, doing point splitting. Okay. So I mean, all other diagram up to some point. And this ladder sum up to some point satisfy this beta salpeter equation. This will be uh, just the analog. Okay, let me just go. Yes, exactly. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, if uh, you take this lambda to be exactly the parameters of the symmetry, the dilatation symmetry that preserve these two cusp point, think about it as R, and uh, if one is the origin, the other is infinity, then the radial position would be E to the lambda. In this parametrization, this, uh, Propagator take this form, the coupling square of, uh, over uh, cos of the difference and cosine of the physical angle between the two. Yeah, this is exactly the the boundary condition is is that I take in these two cutoffs and take it into the point, then I don't have any diagrams, and therefore the correlator should go to one. So these are these two boundary conditions. So if I take in these two cutoffs and colliding them, or I take in these two cutoffs and colliding them, then the correlator should go to one. So now one can uh, consider a solution which has a given uh, dimension, given energy with respect to this uh, parameter. Uh, Yes, so we draw it here. We are summing over all these uh, ladders. And every, every point is integrated over the full thing. Right? Now uh, we're putting here uh, two cutoffs, meaning that this point is integrated up to this point. So taking out derivative with respect to this point, I'm localizing the last propagator here. So I get back the same object, taking derivative here. And derivative here, I get back the same object times a single prop propagator stretch here. So this is this equation, like a Dyson equation. Now, 
you know, that we are looking on uh, a cusp that has a uh, good well-defined dimension, it means that if I do overall dilatation, if I'm moving these two points together, it goes like e to the delta times the, the sum of the two cutoffs. Yes, this would be the open uh, open uh, analog of the graph building operator. Uh, which you got before, exactly. Yes. Uh, sorry, because in we are completely inverting the logic. This is where it started. Um, so, if we are considering a operator with a good overall energy, we remain with an equation just for the related distance of the two points. The, the difference of the related uh, distance of these two points is the wave function. This is the information about which states we accept. So you probe it. And this wave function, therefore, satisfy uh, this better Peter equation becomes just a Schrodinger equation for the wave function. And the Schrodinger energy, it turns out to up to some uh, minus sign square of the conformal dimension. The wave function of the operator that uh, you put in some uh, unknown box, how you probe it, it's the dependence of the relative difference between the two. The overall is the dimension. So this uh, second order the derivative equation, you can write it as the second order derivative with respect to that, second order derivative with respect to that, and this becomes a Schrodinger equation for the wave function, where the Schrodinger energy is the square of the dimension because one derivative <laughs> with respect to overall scaling give you one delta, you get the second order. Yeah, so if you study this, the, this are this are the spectrum of the Schrodinger problem. Right? Here you have some uh, binding potential like that, and you have some energy levels. So the, the infinite many uh, cited states here. Okay, there is the vacuum one, and there's infinite, because we are putting the theory on a sphere with two lines, it has some discrete spectrum. Yes, one, one, vacuum one is just a cusp. Then we can excite it, okay? If you want to excite it in, uh, in perturbation theory, you would have to add the fields, F, yeah. But the equation, whatever you add there after a while, would have just these ladders, so the wave function would satisfy this, and these are the different energies. Actually, your point it was a bit overlooked here because you see that the, the depth of this potential is proportional to the coupling. You would say that at finite coupling, there is at most some finite number of bound states. But it's, it, this is not exactly the problem we are trying to solve. We are trying to solve this problem and the relation between the Training your energy in a dimension required the square root. Actually, you can show that at any coupling there is an infinite tower. How the, the cosine hyperbolic come about? Cosine is just the free propagator. Right. Suppose you have. Uh, suppose I'm considering x to be e to. Uh, x1 to be x e to the r1 and x2 to be e to the r2, then the, the propagator become cosh. It, uh, you know that the, uh, the propagator is also x dot in the front to make it uh, something that does not depend on your, uh, it absorbs the conformal dimension of, of the propagator. In, in that frame. But because in the propagator on top we had x dots, you will get this in any frame you walk. This is it's, uh, okay. I can write explicitly how you get it. Okay. When, uh, so let's suppose we are trying to solve it for the vacuum. Okay. So uh, one can get uh, the explicit solution for the correlator, and the correlator will go one over x one minus x two, 
to the dimension of the cluster problem. But when we do that, when we solve the Schrodinger problem, we are not just getting the spectrum, we're also getting the wave function. We get the full wave function, the full shape of uh, this operator. Again. X1 and X2, or uh, these two fixed points. So now I do the wave function normalization, compute this correlator, and I get the two point function. Ah, in the dimension, in the energy, right? Here it enter in the potential, right? Was dependent on the angle, okay? And therefore the energy is the spectrum which depends on the angle, not to the way. This was the cusp dimension. Ah, here, hidden here. Everything depends on it. Yeah. And just to make a bit of uh, connection to what we talked about yesterday, here when we uh, studied the, this limit for the cusp, one can also consider therefore the corresponding limit for classical strings in ADS, ADS five process five. Having a cusp, meaning that you have an open string that ends on the two lines, and having a twist angle on the sphere, meaning that the string also stretch between two points on the sphere that are related by this rotation angle. And this limit, we want to take it, the rota rotation angle on the sphere to be a boost angle and send it to infinity. And we didn't have to do any work because in the original work of uh, Juan, when considering the first time the dual of Wilson loop, we considered them already for general angle. We just took the answer and took the limit of the answer. And it matched exactly the results from what you get from this Peter Sopeter equation. If you take here G to infinity, the potential become infin infinitely uh, deep and big, and the energy is just the value in the minimum. And the two match, not just qualitatively, not just the power of, of lambda, but also the numbers exactly. Here, the potential of the Schrodinger problem, you see G stand here, so suppose I'm sending G to infinity, which I become uh, infinite, wide, and big, and the vacuum energy is just the value in the minimum. I'm trivial. So now let's, with this uh, knowledge, let's now go and consider three-point function in the ladder limit. Yes, so this is a bit uh, tricky because <laughs> exactly the point. When you have such classical string in ADS, it's a strong coupling. It's its original tooth coupling goes to zero. But in this limit, the, all the dependence on the tooth coupling, exactly reorganizing this combination lambda times e to the i theta, there is no issue of order of limits. So now let's try to use this and go back to the problem of computing correlation function. So now compute correlation function of three cusps in the ladder limit. Now, every cusp has its own internal angle, and therefore, even in the ladder limit, every cusp has its independent coupling. You can take the coupling of the free cusp to be independent. Okay? These ladders are weighted by one coupling, these ladders are weighted by another, and these ladders are, are uh, weighted by a third coupling. Yes, exactly, different G hats. And if to have something non trivial but simpler, Look the, the case where g hat of the cusp number three is zero. So there are no ladders here. There are only ladders here and here, and they talk to each other because they cannot cross. So uh, this was uh, the problem that uh, a bit more here and a half ago, Kolya and his uh, student was uh, studying. So the, the, we just mentioned about the Schrodinger problem. You get there, uh, Schrodinger problem in general, for general angle, you cannot solve analytically. You don't know how, it's not a solvable problem in that sense. Okay. So the best you can do when computing this uh, three-point function is try to express it in terms of the wave function that are eigenstates of the Schrodinger problem. 
That's not that you can write them explicitly. And this is what they did. And what they found, I don't expect you to uh, follow the detail here. This, we, we just emphasize how complicated it is. Okay. There is a, a double integral here, which was the integral over the, this last cusp here, over the, the two lines. There are the two wave functions, the wave function of this cusp, and the v, uh, cusp here, and they're convoluted in this uh, highly non-trivial uh, way where these functions that stand here are non-trivial functions of the points on the lines, and they come about by going between two different frames and so on. So if this is uh, the final result, good luck. <laughs> right. This was, no, the, the original Sergio Schrodinger, uh, Schrodinger problem gives you the wave function and the dimension. Uh, yes. 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 How, how, how you know this? Yes. Yes. Right. It's come from. This is a, so th this I can write also as, uh, so this T and S are the natural variables around cusp one, okay? But the dependence around cusp two is in a different conformal frame. And this T is exactly the transformation between two different frames. Again? Yeah. No, no, the dependence on the coupling only enter for the details of the wave function and the dimension. All of the rest is, is doing this convolution. Starting from doing the gram diagrammatic and normalizing by the treatment function. A priori, yes. Uh, let's go on a second. We go, hey, I'm just trying to say, say look, this, this looks horrible, and uh, good luck uh, doing something with it. But uh, before giving up, what they did is go and try to uh, relate it to the quantum spectroscopy. So uh, for doing that, I have to first explain what it is. So this is, uh, I'm not expert in quantum spectroscopy at all. But let me, uh, as far as I understand, go and explain what it is. Uh, starting from the very basics. The very basic is the asymptotic beta ansatz. Suppose we have some spin chain that is integrable, for example, what is called the XXX, spin up, spin down. Okay. The way that one uh, computes the spectrum there, what is called by the beta ansatz, it tells you that if you have uh, these excitations on the spin chain and you take one around, the state has to go back to itself. And when it go around, it pick a phase, which is the length time its momentum on the chain, times the scattering phases with all the other particles on the way. Okay. Just a comment, if you want to twist this thing, instead of one here, you put exponent of five times the angle. So this is just the same equation written in different variables, where u is just related to the momentum using this half cotangent. Cotang <coughs> it's called a spectral parameter. This is because it makes this equation more algebraic. Okay. What is the Q function? Suppose I'm giving such a solution to a beta equation. Here is the beta equation. The Q function is just a polynomial <coughs> whose degree is the number of uh, excitation, the number of points. So the zeros of this polynomial are the roots of the beta equation. Now this beta equation I can now equivalently write in terms of this polynomial. Suppose look on the following equation. Q times some other polynomial equal to this combination. The beta equation of this, the, the demand that both sides of this equality vanish at the same point. Q here uh, vanish at the location of the beta roots. 
is another polynom that you can walk up with degree immediately. So T would not cancel these zeros. And therefore, the right hand side have to vanish at the location of the zeros. And imagine that the uh, <laughs> right hand side vanish at this point, exactly equivalent to this equation, because the ratio between these two give the momentum, and the ratio between these two give the scattering phases. This is called the ba Baxter equation. It's just a way of rewriting the beta equation. There is another polynomial of whose zeros are the holes, are the, like, the excitation that was not filled. And given the, the solution, one can now compute the energy, the dimension of the operator is just given by uh, this sum that you can write also in terms of the Qs. And given the Qs, finding the Q, I have to solve this equation, and given them, one can compute the energy by just plugging into this equation. And the last point I want to make is that these Qs are also, by themselves, their product, are the wave function in some very mysterious basis, which is called the, the separation of variable basis. Q also indicates for you what is the wave function, special basis, not just the energy. This is this X basis. <laughs> In the simplest case of this exercise, it, it's known how to read it explicitly. In general, I don't think so. So the point line, the Q give you not just the dimension, but also the wave function. And this is exactly, these two are the input for correlation function. Q knows about all the magnums, right? Yes, it's like N and decouple harmonic oscillators. That require no. That does require a big D uh, two, and I'm even not expert in that. But let's see. Let's do this relation very explicit for our problem. Okay. I can write a relation very explicitly. And there is there is a basis of states or of operator. Where these are the wave functions. Yeah. The analog of position space in quantum mechanics. Oh, you, if you plug here the, the roots, yes. But these are different variables. Yes, when X is hit uh, this route, it vanishes. Yes. The zeros. Exactly. Exactly. The different bases. Yes. It takes this form where it, this is an uh, eigenstate. This is, uh, it, it corresponds to a given solution of this equation. What I want to do next is to go to the cusp and do this very explicitly, how to map this Q function to the wave function of the Schrodinger problem. It's actually the main issue. Uh, <coughs> so it turns out that the, the, the Baxter, this Baxter equation for the cusp is taking a very similar uh, form to what I wrote. Take this form again, again Q plus I, Q, U minus I, and instead of uh, this u plus i over 2 to the l is just u squares here. This is the analog equation for the cusp in the ladder limit. U, this is the definition, is the solution to this equation. It has to have this asymptotic at large u, and the t would stand here 
polynomial, this is where the dependence on the angle enters. It's a polynomial of degree two. I, I don't think this is the way, this is not the way it was uh, uh, derived. I think the way it was derived by starting from the, uh, uh, the analog equation for n equal to four, and then taking this double scaling limit. This is what we are going to do in the second, yes, exactly. We're going to do to be some mailing transform of this guy. So the same equation for the x axis, I want to just, we, they are known for the cusp, uh, work out in uh, this paper. So again, you know, have to solve very similar equation, the dependence on the angle enters here, and uh, you can read the dimension, given that you know q in a very similar form. Look even simpler. So exactly what we were adding for, now we have this q that is saying it should be the wave function in some uh, mysterious basis, and we have the wave function in the Schrodinger problem. The wave function in the Schrodinger problem was just E the energy times the overall scale here. Think about this size as S and this size as T times the non trivial wave function that was only dependent on the difference. It turned out that the relation between the two is just a kind of Fourier transform, a Mellian transform. To understand the Q function, you have to Fourier transform it with respect to uh, <coughs> some uh, combination that is written here, and you get the wave function of the Schrodinger. What is this combination? So here are the two cusps, and uh, we draw it here again. Here are the two cusps where the wave function depends on this cutoff on the difference. It depends on one point that we call S here and one point that we call T here. I can always do an overall transformation to put this, to put this S at zero. The overall scale just uh, stand here trivially. Well, <coughs> then uh, draw this point S at the middle of the circle of the other line. This transformation is just a Fourier transform with respect to the angle of this point. It's saying here is just exponent of the angle on this one. This is the relation between the physical wave function we do get in perturbation and this mysterious Q function is just a Fourier transform with respect to the angle on this thing. So, and you see, because uh, it was, it uh, satisfy an equation uh, with a uh, polynomial of degree two, to use here map into two derivative, and this is how this, under this transformation, the Baxter equation become a third, second order differential equation for F, which was the Schrodinger equation before. I didn't, I didn't derive it, I just explain, explain what, what, what this equation mean, but in order to go, you have to, to go to, into the detail. Given that we have this relation, now, now let's go back. We don't know the wave function. We don't, yes? No, no. We want to, uh, it's less trivial than that. If you want to do the analog, you have to start with the cusp with many, many scalar insertion. And then there will be analog of the beta equation, where you have an excitation that runs in the usual spin chain, but then instead going around, it's been reflected from one boundary and then reflected from another boundary and then go back. Okay. There is an analog of the beta equation where apart from the S matrices, there are two reflection matrices, and every S matrix there is one, and then the other, other one with the opposite momentum. What we are talking here about the limit, there is no chain at all. <laughs> it just remains with the two boundaries. analog 
This is the analog for this problem. But they, they are not derived. The, what I was describing before with the beta equation was asymptotic and this has very big, very big uh, length. Here the length is zero. Nice thing about the, this, uh, um, these techniques is that they automatically include all wrapping. So they're valid at any length. kind of one of the most powerful thing about it. So now that we have this explicit map between the two, just a Fourier transform with respect to this angle here, let's go and plug it back into this horrible equation for the three-point function. And when you do so, what they have found is could not be any simpler. Found that this three-point function is just given by an overlap of two Q functions divided by their norm. And the measure for overlapping them or for computing the norm is given by this uh, integral. There is a measure in which you can overlap wave function in these spaces. And the three-point function looks as trivial as overlapping two wave function. I don't think it can be any, more, any simpler than that. Remember, the, the showing problem you cannot solve analytically, also the Baxter equation you cannot solve analytically. There is a very efficient numerical tool to get arbitrary order. But given that you have it, you can now plug it here and compute the two-point function. What is the lesson we are trying to make? We would like to generalize this. Uh, we would like to generalize this to get rid of the cusps, to do it for single trace operators. And at the end of the day, the hope is to generalize it to n equal to 4, meaning that taking the Qs here and replacing them by the Qs in n equal to 4 that are known, which actually the way that these Qs will derive, we have to figure out the corresponding norm for overlapping or for multiplying Qs in n equal to 4. Yeah, the most general one would have also ladders here, and it is not known. Not completely known. Open problem. Yeah. Uh, I don't think it's really needed, because at the end of the day, we want to remove the the, uh, not the Wilson line, also the twist. Yes, in the, in, we are going there, but in the end of the day, I want to remove these cusp angles. What we are doing now, we are going to replace this cusp by twists. And the, the analog of that would be a bit. Um, we, I'll do one example. The two, uh, two of them would be twisted, and the last one would not be twisted. Not the not complete analog, but something in between. And this is enough, because at the end of the day, we want to take the twist to zero. But in general, as, as you said, the, the result, here the result uh, depends only on two Q functions, because there are only two non-trivial wave functions. In general, there is also a third non-trivial wave function. And I don't know the, even in that case, if there is a So what is the analog uh, again? So first we start with n equal to 4 and take the same limit. Take uh, g to 0, but now taking the twist that we started with to i infinity. And this, keeping this combination uh, fixed, and this automatically projects through exactly on the wheel diagram that you are talking about. So an alternative way of seeing this fishnet model is just a limit of given observables in n equal to 4. The ladder, the analog of the ladder limit for twist operators. In that viewpoint, we are never really deforming the model. We are deforming the observable we are looking at. And it is actually a bit more general because here there are only uh, two scalars, but when, when you view like that, you can consider correlation function where different, different operators are twisted in different uh, planes on the sphere, and you can consider more general uh, correlation function than the one that are, are of, uh, this, of this action. Theta here now is the twist 
on the sphere or the scalar. When you go around the final diagram, you apply internal rotation. If you have a scalar, it is a charge one. This is how we got to this crystal. We were trying to get rid of, of the cusps. So what would be the analog of with any cusp but without the cusps, without the real signal. And uh, this is also, I think, hints or giving you what, how the fish chain I was uh, discussing before may be obtained starting from string dual to n equal to four. The twist in a string, so it's clear what you have to do is when you go around the string, instead of coming back to the same point, we're coming to the point that is rotated with respect to it. Now it's clear how to start from that and then take this limit. You would have with a, with a string, this analog to the cusp theorem, extend infinitely on a boost direction on the sphere, but at the same time, the original string tension goes to zero, and you should remain with the uh, goddess. So suppose, consider the sphere. Suppose we are starting with a string that has some charge under some, rota some rotation in some plane on the sphere. Uh, so this is the sphere and, and the, the string is not wrapping anything but is rotating with some uh, charge J. Uh, one way to think about it is to take this uh, sphere and t-dualize it along this direction. If I t-dualize it around this direction, R, <laughs> the radius of the sphere go to one over r. Instead of this picture, it will become uh, something like that. Now we will have uh, a string. I'm describing something that was not done, but how I expect it to work. Okay? Now we get a string that instead of having momentum j, is, having, is winding around the circle j times. Now taking it and twisting it, meaning taking any piece of it that winds around and taking the, the two and breaking it apart, and taking the two points be uh, boosted with respect to each other. This will be the string bits of the fish chain. We wanted to take them to infinity that correspond to the pieces of the string that were wrapping this uh, circle before we twist it. We don't have to t-dualize. This is just making, giving you a, a more intuitive uh, The, from the way the world cheats, yet it is. Because when you go around it, you don't come back to the same point. It's too complexified now. Uh, it will give you a boost in the, in the space. It's not, the theory is not, it's still unitary. It's the, the operator that, yes, it's a complex operator, but nothing wrong with it. Consider a complex scalar, it's also a complex operator. Okay. So now let's, uh, let's go to the actual computation the analog of what we did for the cusp. So here I have a twist that's starting, let's say, at zero at an infinity, and for simplicity, consider operator of length one. And again, I put it some point away from uh, zero as a point splitting, so this is the analog of the G function that we had before for the cusp, which was computing. A two-point function, and all the diagrams that one have to uh, resum in this case are given this four scalar interaction times a propagator between this point and the same point twisted, rotated. So 
This is again the, the graph building operator we're talking about for this simple case of a single uh, line j equal to one. This propagator to go around, relate the point, and this point rotated system. So this way we get just the analog of the beta salpeter equation for the cusp, but now without the cusp. So this is the analog of this picture. Uh, so for the cusp, uh, we had this equation that when you take two derivatives with respect to S and T, you are putting a propagator. Here, the analog of this equation is written there. It's the inverse of the graph building operator. If I'm acting with the box on the extra line here, I'm killing this interaction vertex, this integration over the interaction vertex, because I get the delta function, but time a propagator. This equation is the analog of this equation, but now we are in four dimension instead of in a wave function that depends on a four dimension instead of a wave function that depends just on uh, two points on a line. Um, so <coughs> symmetries. Remember that the, this, if we are rotating by two angles, we are preserving dilatation and rotation in these two angles. So we can characterize the wave function by conformal dimensions and two spins. Okay? So just by uh, symmetry, such a wave function would have the pieces that carry these uh, spins, this rotation in these two planes, and the dimension. What is left is just uh, the analog of the cusp that we left with a wave function that depends on the ratio of the two points. Here we left with a wave function that depends on the ratio of the two radiuses in these two planes. Depends on the angles in this plane. Our symmetries are fixed by the spins. The only the overall thing is the dimension. We just remain with the dependence on the ratio of the two radiuses in these two planes. And uh, now this equation map into a Schrodinger equation again. Solving for the dimension of such a twist operator is equivalent to solving a Schrodinger problem. Now on the right hand side we have zero. Oh, and the dependence on the dimension entering the potential. Closing analog of the cusp. Now here I, I left the, the two angles to be independent. This is a complicated Schrodinger problem that I have no hope of solving in general, analytically. It doesn't have a simple analytic solution. Uh, just to connect uh, to what uh, we talked yesterday, this uh, simplified drastically if you take the two angles to be equal. If you take the two angles to be equal, uh, for example, remove, for example, let's put the, the spins to zero, you just remain with the potential that is one over cos square, which is one of the exactly solvable potentials. Okay. You recall that uh, for two equal angles, we are actually not breaking any rotation symmetry and the wave function is just a three-point function. This is uh, a case where we can, one can easily solve exactly, and this is the spectrum, the exact spectrum. S is this, now the total spin under rotation, and you can also get the full tower of excited states. So <laughs> now let's go and consider, so this we did the analog for the two-point function, so go and consider three-point function, correlation functions, twist operators. For example, one which I want uh, to consider is the true three-point function between two of these twist operators of length one, the one that satisfies this uh, shredding real problem, and one untwisted uh, single trace operator. So here, for example, making made of uh, <coughs> such that it can connect to these two. But here, we, the one which I will be interested is taking the, the Lagrangian itself. Lagrangian itself, you can put the kinetic term or the potential term by the equation of motion, you get the same thing. So you get just the interaction terms of the fishnet model. And here we have to resume all this type of, of graphs in order to complete this uh, three-point function. These are not necessarily heavy. There is nothing to uh, wrap here, right? If I remove this uh, 
x x dagger here, then there will be. I'm focusing on this one because this one we did all the way. It's basically the analog of, of what we did before. Uh, so one can uh, compute it again uh, explicitly in terms of the way unknown wave function. And it's given by uh, this expression. These are the two wave functions. They are normalized by the expectation value of one over cos square, basically. So this is independent of the normalization of the wave function. Times uh, this term that was also appearing in the potential, which originate from taking the ratio between a normal propagator and a twisted propagator. And it's just in this variable. And uh, of course, if you take the uh, Lagrangian now and integrate, what you should get up, up to uh, some log of the distance is the derivative of the dimension with respect to the coupling. Even that one can uh, now get an equation for the derivative of the dimension with respect to the coupling in terms of expectation values in these wave functions of some uh, potential. This also follows directly from the Schrodinger equation. Now let's do as we did before, try to go and replace the wave function by the Q function. And the Q function for the uh, twisted uh, model is also, uh, we also know it, it's take a very, again, a very uh, simple form. The only difference from what we thought there's a shift here by two i, and if it's u times u plus i. Very uh, similar, the dependence on the twist angle, again, enter only through this t, through a polynomial of degree two, and the asymptotics, again, look analog to exactly what we had before for the cusp. No. No, this turned out to be the hardest problem I have ever uh, encountered, which I'm going to now. Relating this to the Schrodinger equation. So uh, how, how to relate this into, into this wave function here that was the solution to the Schrodinger equation. Before it was just some Mellin transform with respect to the angle. This was the uh, main question. So one thing you, you, you would uh, naively try is just do the analog map, the analog transformation. And this is what we, we first tried. This is just the analog equation, just plug it here because it's, uh, again, you have just uh, a polynomial of degree uh, with u square, you will guarantee to get a second order differential equation by such a transformation. And this is what we uh, call the fake Schrodinger because you, it doesn't give you the right Schrodinger. But it gives you something that looks very much similar. For example, the term in the potential that depends on the coupling looks exactly the same. You reproduce it, but not exactly the same thing. Or even in the case where the angles are equal, the only difference between the fake Schrodinger and the real Schrodinger is some uh, the simple function of the dimension. We thought you just do some this, uh, simple change of variables, simple normalization, and it will relate something to the other. And I was literally breaking my head on this for weeks. It's like, if you want to kill your students, give them this problem. Two Schrodinger problem that just differ by uh, some, is something like that small. And in few lines in Mathematica, you can solve this equation numerically with a bind condition. And you see they have the same spectrum. The fake state Schrodinger and the real Schrodinger can compute the, the spectrum numerically to high accuracy, and we see they give the same spectrum. So there is no doubt they should be somehow related. But any such change, small change of variables, thinking about supersymmetric quantum mechanics, whatever, didn't work. Uh, eventually, it turned out that the relation between the two is slightly more complicated than that. So here V is, again, just a change of variable, this time in hyperbolic of sigma, which is not an important point. The important point is that if one wants to uh, relate now the wave function of the fake Schrodinger, which is just Fourier transform of the Q function, to the physical one, one has to apply to it a fractional number of derivatives. Fractional number of derivatives mean an integral transform. So the two are related by this uh, integral kernel. This is, I think we were stuck on this for uh, months. And once you uh, realize that, then you can 
go back to the correlation function and plug back the Q function, and you get a similar expression for the, uh, <laughs> the one with the, the uh, Lagrangian instead. So this is where we are steady now. We are starting to compute other more complicated uh, correlation function, and the aim is to rewrite them in terms of uh, the Q function. This was a huge, uh, almost gave up. Um, <coughs> so just a summary, uh, planar twist operator or generalization of local operators, you can consider them in any planar theory, not just conformal or uh, integrable. Uh, <coughs> the spectrum of uh, correlation function can be computed efficiently using the Q function that automatically resum all wrapping. In the cases we discussed, they were only wrappings. 